Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, the go-to podcast for everything European VC. If you love the show, share it with your friends and join our newsletter at eu.vc. All right, we're here for a special episode today because it's the very first Super Angel episode that we're going to launch on EUVC. What's up with that, David? Yeah, what's up with that? It's like, what the hell? We've always done VC fund managers and GPs and now we're bringing on angels. Well, we got quite a lot of good feedback from people hearing to the Super Angel pod and many of them were actually regular EUVC listeners. So we just realized this is a no-brainer. We have to bring these on to the main European VC podcast. At the same time, of course, it's also very much in line with our ethos of connecting European venture and building Europe's GPLP community. As most of the angels on these episodes, as you'll also hear, are LPs in Europe's leading funds. So to our listeners, operationally, this means that going forward, you'll have a Super Angel episode to listen to every Friday. So enjoy. So yeah, I restate that every Friday you'll have a Super Angel episode to listen to. To those of you who have already listened to them, well, huge thank you, props, <laughs> appreciate it. And secondly, you can also always re-listen to them or just take the episode and send it to someone you love. And if you are really a supporter of UVC, do all of the above. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you guys. Thank you ladies for always being supporters of what we're trying to build. And hopefully you also feel that you're building it with us. But before we dive into this episode, let's just give a big introduction to our dear co-host for this show, Anthony Dannon. This is Anthony Dannon, founder of Cocoa, and I'm a VC turned angel. Now back to this episode's introduction, because we also want to just introduce the guest of the show, of course. David, who do we have on? For the very first episode of the Super Angel podcast, we were joined by Roxanne from Station F. Station F being the behemoth of the French tech ecosystem that you all probably know. And Roxanne being first and foremost, an absolute amazing person and Super Angel, or as the French media tends to call her, the queen of tech. Roxanne is also an Atomico scout, by the way. But before we dive into it, Andreas, you did this interview together with Anthony. I didn't have the pleasure. What were your main takeaways? First of all, I think Roxanne is one of the coolest women I've met in venture for quite a while. So I'm <laughs> keeping an eye on if she should ever decide to launch a GP or something like that, because then I'm first in line. Um, <laughs> I'm probably behind it quite a few, actually, to be honest. But, <laughs> I, would, I would venture say that. <laughs> <laughs> but for this episode, I think my takeaway was she actually coined for me the term baby angel. I loved when she said it. I almost fell off my chair. But Andres, what is that? Explain that to someone that just fell into this episode and has no context whatsoever. It's so close to just what we talk about when we say operator LPs or operator angels or operator LP angels, whatever yeah. the terminology that we tend to use. But it's, of course, someone who brings that operator experience, the experience of actually working with founders, investing themselves and so on. And for that reason, are coming in typically with smaller tickets than what's usual. And that's, of course, the uh, the absolute raison d'etre of uh, the EUVC syndicates. Yeah, and that's really cool. And that, again, goes back to this topic of why the hell are we reeling this into this podcast? But also, you know, Roxanne is somewhat of a reference as an angel investor. I'm sure there's also learnings there for someone that is just doing, as I would call it, traditional angel investing into startups. Anything you'd highlight, Andreas? Yeah, so I think that this episode, as you hear it, and the whole series really, uh, you'll find that every single angel that we interview are not doing large tickets, concentrated bets, but deploying a strategy that has, you know, the potential to hit outside returns by spraying and praying, some might call it, but definitely uh, building up a larger portfolio. And I think that this episode states it very well by Roxanne stating as one of her core learnings that check sizes actually doesn't matter. She thought it really, it really would be something you need to bring quite a lot of capital to the table for founders to want to take your money. That turned out not to be the case, but I will not spoil more for you, everyone. I think <laughs> let's just go right into the episode. This is a dream? No, it's not a dream. I'm an angel. Why would God send me an angel? Because God knows that everyone needs a little coaching now and then. I'm loving angels. I saw an angel. All angels 
Hi, and welcome to the Super Angel Podcast, the go to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our community at eu.bc. Today, we're happy to welcome you to Roxanne, director of Station F in Paris and one of Europe's absolute leading startup havens. Roxanne is broadly recognized as one of the most influential figures in the French, if not the European startup ecosystem. French media have called her the young empress of startups, the queen of tech, and the new pope of high tech and startups in France. Roxanne is an Iranian American who grew up in Silicon Valley, was formerly a journalist and startup ambassador before being headhunted to spearhead the development of Station F. If you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end -end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. Roxanne, welcome to the Super Angel Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here with us here. Super, I'm excited to be here. Hey guys, uh, Anthony, I'm a, a VC turned angel with Cocoa and I'm super excited to be co-hosting this podcast with Andreas. And you know, Andreas, I'm really thrilled to have Roxanne join the show. Uh, she's genuinely one of the most dynamic people I know. I mean, besides being a power woman in tech, which we need much more of, she's really one of the central pillars of the French tech ecosystem, which I hold close to my heart. So I'm really excited to have you join us today, Roxanne. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. And Anthony, you're one of the most dynamic people I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. I'll take that as a compliment. So I would love to get started, actually. I would love to start with focusing on the story uh, and would love to have listeners hear your story. And uh, can you also tell us what got you into angel investing specifically? Maybe just to backtrack for people who don't know my background. So I'm from the US. I moved to Europe about 13 years ago to do a master's degree and fell in love with the ecosystem. And I've worked at a bunch of places like TechCrunch, Microsoft and now it's Station F for the last seven years. And I actually got into angel investing in 2018. It was when Atomico was launching their angel program. And I was one of the first people to be in, in that angel program. And I remember just thinking angel investing is so cool, but I'd never done it. And it felt actually really scary. And especially it's Atomico's money. So I was like, I can't just do any deal. It has to be like an Atomico worthy deal. And I was so stressed about doing the deal that like, I think a lot of time went by that I didn't deploy. And then finally, Sophia Benz, who was running the program at the time came out and she's like, don't overstress, deploy small checks, a lot of them. And that kind of really helped. It was some really great advice that got me going. And so now it's been quite a few years later, scouting for Sequoia, doing some personal checks, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get a chance to dive into all of it. Could you expand a bit, Roxanne, on that, you know, philosophy of uh, <laughs> deploy small checks and a lot of them? Could you just take us through because you said that was a bit of an eye opener and what got you going? How do you think about that? Yeah, so I think I had kind of this really naive perception at the time that it was the check size that people were going to sign up for. And so Atomico, I think they've probably evolved the program since. But at the time, they were giving 100K to their angels to deploy in minimum two companies over 12 months. I think that was the deal. And I was thinking, well, if I want to have maximum impact, if I want companies to accept my checks, I should probably be doing big checks, like 50K in two companies. And that just stressed me because I was like, well, then for 12 months, I have to just pick two companies. And Sophia was like, no, 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 no. Like, just think about this. You kind of want to just get your hands in a bunch of things. And in order to be able to do that, you have to think much smaller. And I was surprised to see that actually 
the check size was not really the issue. And it's more about really having a good connection with the team. And so that was some really great advice that she gave me. Yeah, that does resonate um, with me as well. Like having been an angel for the past two years on kind of the plethora of deals you want to do. And they do say you can't have really favorite babies, but any memorable deals you want to share with us, maybe a company, what they do and why you invested, that will be great. So memorable deals, I have a ton of like what I feel are memorable deals. I think part of it comes from how the deal was done. So I've had actually two of my favorite deals were actually deals that initially I turned down. And afterwards I had like, I don't know, it's like FOMO or regret or what, but I was literally, I also love to, I think the, the response to the rejection, I don't know if I want to call it a rejection, but just me turning down the deal. I really loved their response so much that I was like, oh, maybe that's actually somebody I want to back. Um, a lot of humility, people asking for feedback, wanting to learn, still wanting to keep a dialogue, a relationship. And even in some cases, people just coming back with like, okay, you didn't give me money, but what else can you give me? And I actually think that those are people I'm like, oh, maybe I should back them. Two of my favorite deals I've actually backed later after having said no to the first uh, discussion. Some deals that I have really loved is one, one deal that I've, or two, is an initial deal where the company actually didn't end up working out. The founders split up. And today I've backed both of their new companies separately. And I feel like the second companies for both of them are quite solid. So I'm really excited to see also that maybe it doesn't work out the first time, but it's really a long-term relationship and a long-term play. And so I'm really excited about what these two now separate co-founders are building independently. It can resonate to me as well a lot when it comes to uh, not picking the babies, but also the, the learnings that you shared. And, and But what about if you take a step back, right? Now you've been doing that for a couple of years. Looking back, what would you say angel investing has given you both professionally and personally besides interacting with those awesome people? Such a hard question. So I do think interacting with awesome people, it's like having access to also the angel community and doing deals with people who are angels, often I feel like those are also, um, you know, you have a lot of experienced entrepreneurs in those communities. And I think being able to see how they think and what decisions they make is super valuable. It's something that I didn't have access to before. Like when we go through, you know, startup programs and picking companies, it's very different than when you're making a decision to invest, where I feel like you really dive into a lot more elements and on a much deeper level. So I think that's one it's also kind of given me a different, like you kind of a little bit more of an insider into some of the companies. So the relationship, I would say that it's kind of just brought me closer to entrepreneurship. Even though you're not the founder, you're just kind of seeing the business from a very different level than when you're not an investor. That's exactly it as well, right? Like the difference between having been an operator and founder versus being an investor, do you think you stretch similar muscles with the two or is it very complementary to the skill set as well? I mean, obviously you're not necessarily operating for the business. So it's one step removed from operating but you actually get a better view of the businesses that you're involved in as an investor. So when you're not an investor, sometimes entrepreneurs, when they talk about their business, they feel less comfortable sharing actually how is it going and, you know, stuff with the team and some of the metrics and this strategy didn't like, you won't actually get so much insight. So I feel like in a way it's complementary to operating And I do feel that also the operating experience can really be leveraged for some of the companies. So that's also really interesting to see. Roxanne, now I want to shift this into uh, what is probably my favorite part of (laughs) these interviews, or or at least one that I like a lot. And that is diving into your investment thesis and strategy and approach. So if you would just give us, you know, an overview of, of kind of how you think about your investments, what number of investments you've done, what active investments you have right now. How do you think about, you know, the makeup of your portfolio? Do you want all of them to be in the same vertical? Would you rather diversify a bit more? How many do you want to lead? How many do you want just want to co-invest in? Do you want to take board seats? Do you not? All, all that kind of thinking around that. Oh, no. It's not about the thesis. Whoa! 
wow, that's like <laughs> way more developed yeah, than yeah, my well, yeah. <laughs> Everything that Andreas just said. Um, no, so I think to kind of hash it out, I don't even think about it as a thesis. I think about it as just where am I comfortable as an investor? And it took me a while to get there because when I started, I mean, <laughs> been in touch with entrepreneurs for so long and on such a different level. And there's just so many great people that you meet with great ideas and you can just get so excited and be like, I want to back you and you and you. And it took me a while to figure out actually where do I, you have limited resource and limited time. Where do you really want to spend your effort? And that's something that I think I had to spend time to realize I'm really comfortable with France-based businesses, even though I have a network that goes beyond that. This is a market that I feel like I know. It took me a while to, I mean, everybody loves talking about like really game-changing deep tech, not an area that I'm super comfortable in. An area that I love is way more boring than that. It's B2B, SMB tools, SaaS, HR tech I've done a ton of. So, you know, it's stuff that I just feel like I understand the pain a lot better. And I have a like potential market at Station F that, you know, we, we need to test things or ask people like people are willing to, to contribute. So I feel like I can also bring more value. So I would say it took me a while to get to that. And then also how I receive and evaluate deals also took me a while to, to get comfortable with. So, you know, I don't obviously do a lot of cold stuff. I look at also who can the entrepreneur surround themselves with, what kind of credible people. Usually I like to know people personally that are backing them to be able to bounce ideas around. I know other investors that are looking for like a big brand name or a lead VC or something like that. So I do look for a little bit of credibility. It's taken me a while to to kind of even get to that point. I don't take board seats today. I'm on the board independently of, of two other companies that I haven't invested in. Why don't you take board seats? I think my checks are so small. <laughs> And also I've done a lot of deals. So you asked me to share some numbers. I've done 45 deals to date across Atomico, Sequoia, and personal checks. That's a lot of companies having to pick where I would spend my time would just be impossible. And so, yeah, I try, I tried to also like dive a little deeper into, into the numbers to be able to show with the listeners. So I've done a couple deals as a baby LP in different funds. I've done a couple of non-tech deals. So I do go outside my comfort zone, but majority of the stuff tends to be in the comfort zone that I just mentioned. I've invested in two X station F employees. So people that actually I've worked with and I've seen them. I love being able to invest in those kind of people. I have about one third of the companies I've invested in that have gone to series A or series B stage today. And one company I think that has officially wound down to date and then 12 female founders and I cover a bunch of geographies even though I talked about France I've done stuff all over the place so can also talk about a little bit what happens when you go outside of your um, normal geography <laughs> yeah for sure but I'll do the flip side of what Andrea's asking you about the board seat I'll say the opposite like how do you think about with 45 companies scaling yourself on the portfolio support side you know in my experience I've found that the most valuable help I've been able to give to to companies has been inherently unscalable so like emotional support but how do you think about that or trying to be helpful in so many companies if you can what i imagine i bring to most of the companies is network if they're looking for introductions to people i'm very happy to open those doors that doesn't take a ton of time for me and people it's very non-scalable <laughs> so people have to tell me who they want to meet and it's very easy for me to put them in touch I think the second thing that I probably bring is, you know, people are looking for stuff around communications, marketing, they want to test it on a specific population. That's stuff that I'll just do one-on-one -on -one with the given company. Not super scalable either. And then I've done an investments where just like, I accept that I bring little value <laughs> to it. And I'm just waiting for the entrepreneur to tell me where I can be helpful. I've also found myself that sometimes the founders I want to help most don't really need my help because they're just on it and ahead of me so it's it's a fun controversy there as well would love to dig deeper as well on the due diligence side and how you think about evaluating those companies as well also including kind of you know the wisdom of the crowd right do you have peers other people you use to assess those companies um, and how do you go about that would be fantastic I have to always speak to the person 30 minutes, but I won't accept a call without seeing a deck. And I know that there's entrepreneurs that try to be like, oh, well, I don't show a deck without being on a call. And I just, I will just not accept it. So I usually see a deck, then I jump on a call and 
usually I'm trying to get from that call everything that's not in the deck. And entrepreneurs always want to show me their deck on the call. (laughs) So I'm like, no, no, no. Tell me the backstory. Tell me how you met. Tell me, you know, all the stuff that you didn't put in in the deck because I got all the numbers and the sexy logos from the deck. And so that's really what that 30 minutes is about and trying to really understand where they shine. What have they been able to do differently? How are they thinking about things? How are they thinking about their next step? You know, and I think also just trying to challenge them and see how they respond to some challenges and stuff like that. So that's what I'm trying to get from that call. But there will be a lot of stuff that I walk away from, like, I didn't understand half of it. If I'm still feeling like this could be something really interesting and I, I want to be a part of it, I might bring someone else or ask a couple people in my network, can you take a look at it? Have you heard of this company? And what's really funny is a lot of the time, I get a response right away. Yeah, I know so-and-so looked at it. They loved it. This person's considering it. So those are really good signs. And if I have people that are just like, never heard of it, didn't talk to them, you know, usually that's either it's super early and I'll tell the entrepreneur, come back when you have some validation or it's just not picking up. So I think those are also signs to pay attention to. I love that. So basically developing own conviction, but using basically your peers and network to kind of enhance your your due diligence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Makes a lot of sense. So, Roxanne, you said two things that obviously to anyone who knows EUVC are very close to my heart. <laughs> so you said, and I love the term, I'm a baby LP in a couple of funds. Uh, <laughs> so I need, of course, you know, we're doing syndicates into funds with the explicit thesis that LP tickets can be quite valuable for angels to do. So I'd love to hear, you know, what you have gotten out of that and how you think about those tickets, why you do them. Also, if you're able to disclose any of them that you've done, then feel free to name them. But otherwise, tell us how they fit into how you think about your investment activity as an angel. Sure. So actually, I think I do them one to learn first and foremost. And then the second one is obviously, if I, I'm, I'm obviously there also, also hoping not to lose my money entirely, but do have to be comfortable with the idea that I could lose it. So I think, um, yeah, I'm happy to disclose three that I did. Weekend Fund, so Ryan Hoover's fund. Spice Capital, which is Web3. It's an incredible solo female GP in the US. And then Origins, which is this fund, um, kind of they have a very interesting model, but it has a star football player from France who's one of the GPs. And I found that really very interesting because it's looking at leveraging his audience to support the businesses that they invest in. So yeah, I think really what I'm doing here is also to, to learn from those investors who are really deploying at a very different level and scale than some of the angels in my network, how they're also seeing deals. And a lot of these smaller funds, I feel like also take the time to share their deal flow, share their analysis, share why they turn this one down. Why are they investing in this one? And I think the the reporting potentially goes into a very deeper level as with maybe some of the bigger funds. I'm not an investor in a ton of big funds, so maybe that's something that is not the case. But it's also been really eye-opening. For example, the Web3 fund that I invested in, it's not an area that I know really well, and it's been incredible to also watch how she's been evaluating the market. It's just amazing. I think we need more LPs like Roxanne, to be honest. And, <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> no, I'm not saying that other LPs are not good. I'm just saying, you know, we also made the conscious choice at Cocoa to make sure that like majority of our LPs are either founders or operators like Roxanne, because essentially for us, what that ends up being is, you know, they're a source of great new investments for us because they're in the flow of what's happening. They're fantastic people that we can go to when it comes to due diligence. They have specific, you know, sector focuses, geo focuses. They understand things that others don't. They're super connected and they can be highly valuable to our portfolio companies. And if you integrate it into your workflow as you invest, it's also very organic to make introductions to them, to portfolio, to companies you're looking to invest into as well. So it's a win-win relationship across. So I, I really, really think that people are lucky to have you and uh, hoping for more of you, Roxanne. Super. And I hope uh, I will get a spot in Cocoa one day. <laughs> uh, that's a I'm going to put it on the podcast so everyone can hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm saying here, don't take ours, Roxanne. It's a coveted spot that everyone wants. <laughs> uh, I think that, that there's an important learning here to be, you know, teased out and, and really emphasized for the audience, which is, you know, coupling what both of you said, Roxanne, you're doing it to learn and you're doing it with small managers primarily who care about you 
and for that reason also share deals with you, share learnings with you, you know, you're on a trajectory together. And then we had the example from the other side with Anthony explaining how, how he as a GP thinks about, you know, mm. the group of angels that are similar to you, Roxanne. And that is not something you as an angel should expect any fund wants to do <laughs> because it, it's not every fund that has that perspective and looking for that type of, uh, of LP. So that's something you want to maximize for. And obviously that's something that we look for because we have this thesis of enabling angels to strengthen themselves via LP tickets. But it's just a caveat for people not to just think, okay, next time a fund comes by that invests in B2B SaaS, just like I do, I'll invest. <laughs> think about it and make sure that, that you have a good strategic match on that front. The other thing that I wanted to dive into, Roxanne, was you said, I can also share a bit about what happens when you go outside of your own country. Tell me, <laughs> lay, lay it on us. What have you learned? Out here learning more about them angels, are you? So I've invested, obviously, outside of France. So the geographies that I've done personal checks in are U.S., U.K., France, and Germany. And I understood too late, very late, but ended up doing the deal anyway because it's a great deal and I love the company. But I ended up understanding the process, like the actual paperwork process, late in the game. And so for a German deal, you have to go get the documents notarized and apostiled. And I was just blown away by the fact that it's like such a ridiculous process. And so I just think it's really good that when people go outside of their traditional geography to really know everything about how the deal works before committing, because that can also slow down the founder. And I was very lucky that I had founders that were not, you know, super uptight about timing and things like that. But this took mu much more time than I expected to uh, put a, uh, essentially a very small check into this business. Share with us your broader wisdom. I mean, if you had <laughs> to stick to three, right, what would you say are your key learnings in angel investing more broadly then? would love to hear. Oh, my key learning. So I think we, we talked a little bit about some of them already, but I would say the comfort zone is really big for me because until you really, and people call it a thesis, but for me, it's really comfort zone. Until you figure that out, I feel like you're just kind of like blindly navigating through all the deals that you could receive. And if you're limited in terms of money and time, which most investors probably are at some point, you really have to take some time to understand that. I would say the second thing that I learned that I really wasn't expecting, and I, I mentioned this when I talked about Atomico and my experience with that, was the check size doesn't actually really matter so much. And I really wasn't expecting that. And actually, over time, the check size, I've even had companies be like, and it's obviously, it's really great when you hear a company say this, but like, I, I'm oversubscribed. I don't have space for your initial check size. Can you squeeze it down? And that's stuff that I just would have never thought of before I started investing. So it's been really interesting. And so people who tell me, like, I have people that I talk to and they're like, oh, I want to invest. And I'm like, well, just write a small check. They're like, no, nobody will ever take my ridiculous like 5k. And I'm like, yes, they will all take your ridiculous 5k. Just go and try it out. So honestly, I don't think people need to worry about that. And yeah, I would say my last learning is probably this situation that I just mentioned with the German deal um, about the procedure. But I'll, I'll add another one, actually. Um, it's about turning down deals. And that was a big learning for me. Because before you start investing, and you hear this a lot from uh, investors, they say, you know, when I turn down a deal, I try to be really specific and give feedback. And actually, the truth is, that not everybody is ready for feedback. So I have developed <laughs> this strategy where I give a very broad statement to say like, you know, not going forward at this time. And I've been surprised to actually see very few people actually want specifics from that point on. So yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And goes counter to all of what the VCs are trying to do, right? Which, uh, <laughs> well, which I love. you spend a lot more time too, so I can understand after like so many calls and hours, you should spend that time. But maybe uh, little baby angels like me don't don't need to do that. Yeah, and on the check size, it couldn't resonate more, right? Like the two years prior to Cocoa, I was angel investing. I wanted to do something like 10k checks, and my average was more like five because not only was I sometimes not accepted, I was def definitely downsized. So I would totally agree that smaller is better for most founders, especially the founders that get oversubscribed. Yeah. And actually, one thing that I started doing was I would ask people, what's your minimum check size? 
And sometimes I would just say, I don't fit into your minimum. And they would just come back and be like, oh, I just lowered my minimum. <laughs> so people, <laughs> people should not be afraid of, of the check size at all. I'd love to not challenge you, but yeah, maybe challenge both of you to, uh, and it's not on your view, <laughs> but it's on, on what you might be open to say. But I'd also say that that check size part is a bit contingent on the sophistication, both of the ecosystem or the angel group that you are you know, hanging around mm -hmm. with. And I'm mm -hmm. seeing two very nodding faces here. <laughs> Would either of you pick it up from there and then say a bit about how you view that? Because I am, you know, the VC guy. I'm investing into VC funds. So I don't want to, you know, put words in your mouth more than I just did. <laughs> if you're in the luxurious position to be a company that is well sought after and you have all the VCs running behind you, then you usually end up basically trying to optimize for what is your round composition, right? And in that situation, you usually would have one lead VC or two maybe VCs in, and then you'd optimize for the long tail with angel investors. Now, usually you don't have as much space as you need to, and there is ecosystems, especially in the UK, France, Germany, Sweden, and, and some other ecosystems where there is a lot of angel investors that are quite sophisticated, do quite larger checks, that have committed and overcommitted, and you have to pick who to get into, right? So I would agree it is partly a function of the maturity of the ecosystem, but it's also a function of how much momentum you have on your deal. And then the other interesting thing about that, if I flip it around from the founder's perspective, is what do you do, right? Because fragmentation... There is such a thing as like too much fragmentation of your cap table, right? Your cap table is a bit like expensive real estate. On the other hand, you want to kind of maximize value per head you're getting. And a lot of those angel investors are very valuable. And the most difficult thing of all, within angel investing, it's very difficult to assess ex ante how much uh, value add and how present the angels will actually be because they're doing it personally, right? And they might be busy and they have families and their work and you might end up getting a 5K check that's going to change your game or a 100K check from your dream hero that's just not available. So I've broadened your question to answer on how to optimize for that. But yes, agree. I think thankfully, increasingly, Europe is borderless and a lot of those great angels are chasing companies no matter where they're based. So hopefully we'll get those spillover across. Yeah, I definitely agree with what Anthony just said. And I think also I love the comparison to the real estate. <laughs> That's a really great way to think about it. I also think that, well, you mentioned that check size is also linked to the sophistication of the market, but I also think it's linked to the person, the individual. And so some people, I think, as you mentioned, you can afford to take a smaller check because they're bringing a different level of value to the company. So I think people who are interested in, in getting involved in investing and maybe don't have a ton of capital should really think about where they stand and what they can bring in addition. Yeah, 100%. And the last thing without overextending the topic is like understanding skin in the game or level of commitment by check size. It's the relative check size, right? Some people have large liquidity events and it might be a rounding error to them. For others, they might be cash constrained and putting the 5K means sacrificing spend for a month, right? Very good point. <laughs> for someone like I me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, love, I, love, I love the nuts there. I would just ask, um, because you said something about managing the cap table there, Anthony, and, you know, some ecosystems are more used to doing SPVs that bring everyone into, you know, one line on the cap table, whereas others, you know, tend to more bring everyone in on, on their own line. How do you think about that? What's best practice? How do you think about it as an angel? I'm, I'm asking both of you here. So I think generally uh, what we encourage founders to do is to start from a position of being selective, right? Because I think constraining yourself on how many people value adds that you want to bring in is a good exercise in itself because there's so many people that could be helpful to you. So thinking about that fragmentation on your cap table from the get-go and saying like, I don't want to have 15, 20 angels on my cap table because it just doesn't make sense. It's going to be a nightmare on chasing them on the legals and the complexity of that, I think is best practice. Now, there are circumstances, or in most circumstances, you might start thinking that's the case and you're solving for that, but then you met the you know, X person that you can't live without having on, your, on board or the Y person that you really want to bring on board, so you might end up having the 8, 10, 12 
angels in the end. And in those circumstances, I think it is best practice, especially for the ecosystems where setting up SPVs are easy to kind of set an SPV and add some of those angels in. And that's just a matter of uh, legal nuance, right, to make things easier. Some angels won't accept that or because they're large uh, checks, they want to be independently on the cap table. But we're increasingly seeing and we actually have recently done a deal where the founder, two deals where the founders actually added fragmented angels under one SPV for that reason exactly. I actually haven't done a ton of SPV style deals, although I am seeing more and more of them. I think the reason is, well, one, in terms of um, scouting, the scout programs don't tend to, to like SPV format. So that's one. But as a personal angel, I also feel like I'm not opposed to it at all. But sometimes in the way that the SPV is launched, it looks like a way also to fill a line rather than to create a relationship. And so if I have a really strong relationship with the founder, I don't really care what format, how I get in there, whatever's friendliest for the founder. But if it's more of a distant relationship, I'm not, SPV is not my favorite form. Very good point. And totally agree with that. Okay. If you would allow me, then I will take us into the uh, quick fire round. Quick fire round. Are you ready for it, Roxanne? I don't know. Am I ready for it? <laughs> All right. tough, sure, I'm tough. scared, but let's go. <laughs> okay. So the first question is, what is the most counterintuitive thing that you have learned since you started angel investing? I think it's what we mentioned about check size, actually. I, would, I just really thought that raising money is raising money. And today, raising money is really, money is almost not, <laughs> is not the topic. I think that's one. And I think the other most counterintuitive thing is, I think it comes back to those deals that I did where I actually initially turned them down. I thought that when you turn down a company, you turn them down. That's the end of the relationship. Actually, in many cases, it's just an ongoing discussion over a long period of time, and it's just not the right time, the right stage. So that's something I didn't really have. I thought angel investing... When you say no, it's closed. So yeah, those are my two non-counterintuitive points. And Roxanne, just because you refer to this day and age where you said today or something like that, I'll say to our audience that we are looking at the date saying 17th of November. So this is post, post-tech post crash or whatever we want to call it that we're <laughs> in right now. So what, what Roxanne is saying is that even though we are in this situation where we have a bear market, the best founders still are you know not looking just to get cash in just to to emphasize that my second question is what would be your top tips to angels wanting to do more international investments so my first tip is are you sure <laughs> and then my second tip is probably i mean i just find it has been incredible and i'm still kind of learning about all the different angel groups and syndicates and things that exist so i think people wanting access to great deal flow that is the best place to start and people wanting access to other people in those networks that can maybe validate or help them validate deals that's a really great thing to do and then for people who maybe don't see or don't have access to the networks, I also encourage them to start them themselves. And that's something that I did. I have a small female angel group in France and it's starting to gain a bit of momentum. But it, it's also um, something that I think people can do across borders. And I've seen some international investor groups gain momentum as well. So definitely that's where I would tell people to start. And final question is maybe a bit more on the personal side, depending on uh, which way the answer will go. But the question is, what advice would you give your own 10-year younger self if you had 30 seconds to say something to yourself? So this is about investing or just life in general? <laughs> life in general, whatever pops in your mind. Oh my God, really? Oh my God, what would I give I kind of like as advice? You know, I think maybe I would have started investing sooner to be honest it's something that just was so it seemed so inaccessible to me and I'm really grateful that Atomico launched this program because it allowed me to take risks with somebody else's um, money essentially obviously I wasn't splashing it around but I do think that probably I would have maybe invested in a couple companies sooner if I knew that you could write a smaller check size, if I knew that I could just go and talk to companies about getting into their cap table. So, um, so yeah, maybe that's the advice I give myself. 
It's always, always great when we have chats. I really, really appreciate you making it today with us and joining us. Very, very much enjoyed it. Very much looking forward to co-investing a lot. Very much looking forward to making sure you're closer to Cocoa as well. Going back to your comment before. <laughs> I heard a promise there, Roxanne. <laughs> Thank you. I heard it too. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, <laughs> um, no, but just wanted to just extend a, a huge thank you. You've even made uh, the Paris ecosystem more enjoyable to me so much so that I'm spending so much of my time there. So looking forward to seeing you there in person soon. And thank you again for joining us. Awesome. Thank you guys for having me on the show. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Super Angel Podcast, the go-to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends and join our Angel LP Syndicate at eu.vc. And if you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. And now, some words from our beloved sponsor. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. You've been touched by an angel, girl.